Welcome to another Parallel Project Training podcast. My name's Ruth Phillips and I'm here with Carmen Campos, who's one of our senior trainers. And today we're going to be talking about resource management from the syllabus of the APM PMQ that is launching in September 2024. So Carmen, welcome to the podcast today. Hello. On the podcast, we look at the syllabus, learning objectives and the learning outcomes. And then we have a chat about what the APM would like us to understand about this topic. The learning objective says that we've got to understand resource management as the ability to identify and schedule the required internal and external resources. All about resources today. Let's have a look at this first learning outcome. Then, Carmen, you can talk to me about the resource management on a project. First of all, let's go back to the basics. What actually is a resource, Carmen? So a resource is very simply anything and anyone you need to complete the project successfully. So that could involve personnel, it could be materials, any supplies, technology, any other equipment. And in general, those could be things that you share uh, with other projects or resources specific to your own project. Okay, so they've said resources, internal and external resources. What's the difference? So internal resource will be resources within the organization. So it will be organizational staff, it will be organizational um, equipment and external resources are things you need to go outside to procure, maybe right. from a third party supplier or a contractor. That makes sense. So what, what's resource management then? What, what's involved in that? So resource management involves a number of activities, including identifying the resource requirements for mm -hmm. your project, scheduling the resources, that means allocating them to your project schedule, and actively managing those resources throughout the project life cycle. Right. We've got these three activities and this is a, a, a pretty crucial topic because we've done all of the planning, the definition of the scope, etc. But unless we've got any resources, we're not going to get any of this work done. So uh, it's, it's fundamental to project success. Exactly. So our first learning outcome is that we've got to know how to determine the resources required and their availability to deliver activities within a project. So you told me that there were three activities within resource management. Let's talk about this first one then. How do you actually identify re resource requirements in the first place? Okay. The first step is to understand very well the scope, especially if you are in a linear life cycle. Mm. Without knowing what deliverables you have to complete and without knowing the work required, you will not be able to have a good idea of what resources you need. All that information can be documented in work breakdown structure or any similar tool. And by having that detail, the project manager in linear projects will have a really good idea of the type of resources that is needed to complete yeah. our project. Okay. And I guess if we get any of that scope wrong, we might end up with the wrong resources or missing resources. Yes, that's right. For example, if I am doing the scope definition for my new house and I forget to define I need a heating system in that new house, then I will not be able to anticipate that I will need a boiler, a heating engineer, perhaps some equipment to do some welding. So in linear projects, it all starts with understanding your scope. Okay, that's identifying resources. We then talked about scheduling them and allocating to the project. What things do you have to think about then? So once you have a picture of the resources that you require, when you allocate them to, to your timeline, you need to consider what type of life cycle we have. Um, I know we're going to cover that in another criteria, but um, the project manager needs to understand that the way you allocate resources will be different because particularly for iterative life cycle, you may not have that full definition of the scope. You also need to consider the demand. Mm -hmm. In other words, how many do you need? How many bricks do you need? How many builders do you need? And often the PM will identify that demand just using their expert judgment or perhaps any previous knowledge or, or experience. Okay, it could so, even be a requirement as well. You might yeah. need like health and safety, a minimum number of, of people to conduct the task. That's going to be important if there's competing demands for resource or if there's even shortages. Exactly. Yeah. Now, once you know how many you need, that's also going to be something you need to think about in terms of how long things will take because mm. you need to understand if they're available or not to your project. 
So yeah. once you understand when they are required, you could then confirm their availability because if not, you're going to have to use some of the resource management techniques to optimize that. Other considerations could be the cost as well. The PM needs to know if there are any budget constraints when allocating resources, mm -hmm. because ultimately the project needs to ensure that it's financially viable. So we've determined the, the resources, we've looked at our scope, we've worked back from there, we've understood the resources, we've got these considerations in, in mind. We've got another learning objective now, which is to understand how resources are categorised and allocated. And then we're going to talk about how that might differ in different life cycles. So resources, how are they categorized? The main four will be human resources, yeah. personnel, staff, or, or maybe external contractors, mm -hmm. the materials, that's the second category, yeah. uh, equipment, or yeah. some people refer as plant, and, and any facilities, any spaces. When we're allocating our resources, what are the differences that will be in our project because of the different life cycles. So if it's a linear life cycle, how is that going to change the way that we do resource management? So when you allocate resources in a linear life cycle, you assume that your key driver is delivering all the scope of work. So you start scheduling the activities and once you have all the different categories identified, you need to understand when those resources are are required. So really your driver is your scope and your time scales. Yeah. Um, okay. And you try to maintain that schedule and maintaining um, the achievement of, of the requirements of your products. That information is not often known in iterative projects. So the way it works in iterative projects is that the requirements in the scope will be prioritized and delivered within your time box. So your time is fixed. Mm -hmm. So you need to allocate resources available for that period, for that time box, even if you don't know in detail all the requirements. So it's almost yeah. the other way around. It, it seems to me that when you're in a linear life cycle, what you're trying to do is uh, define your scope as clearly as possible so that you really understand what the resources are, what the different categories of resource are. You know things down to their skill set, their availabilities, their costs, etc. Whereas for iterative life cycle, we're almost fitting the scope of what we're able to deliver around the resource allocation that we've got, which is fixed. Yes, that's right. And of course, you have to achieve certain quality as well in iterative. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is also key. But resources need to be allocated before we could do that prioritization. Yeah. yeah. And considering the different categories as well is important in both linear and, and iterative. Yeah. We've looked at two learning outcomes now. We skipped over the second one that's in the syllabus um, because it wasn't in, in the right order for how we wanted to talk about things. That second one then says that we've got to understand how an organisational breakdown structure, which is something that we call an OBS, is used to create a responsibility assignment matrix, which is a, a RAM or a RACI, R-A-C-I, a RACI chart. So these are two tools of techniques that we can use to help us with our resource identification, our resource management. So let's talk a little bit about those. What's an organisational breakdown structure? So the organisational breakdown structure or OBS, what it does is map out all the roles involved for the project. So it organises them in a hierarchical way in order to show who has a role and also what are the escalation routes for any problems that may need escalating in the project. Yeah. Okay. We've had a work breakdown structure, product breakdown structures, cost breakdown structures. Yeah. Now we've got one with resources and organisational breakdown structure. Exactly. So the organisational breakdown structure is a way to represent all these different roles, mm -hmm. but the real power of it is when you combine that with the tasks in the work breakdown structure, because you could yeah. use that to start assigning responsibilities for the various tasks. Perfect. So that brings us on to the famous RACI chart or the RACI matrix or uh, known as a responsibility assignment matrix. Describe this to me, Carmen, and tell me how this is useful. So a RACI chart is a very common tool to start identifying responsibilities and accountabilities. It stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, 
and inform is just a matrix to start documenting who will be responsible for a particular task and also identify who will be the person in best place to become accountable because often people use responsible and accountable with the same meaning but it's not quite yeah. the same thing. So let's be really clear then what is the difference between somebody who's accountable and somebody who's responsible for something? So someone responsible for doing the work um, so for example if I'm building my house and I my work breakdown structure said we need to do the drawings of the house. You could put a, an architect as the yeah. person responsible for that task. Okay. Now, the person accountable will be the one that has the accountability to ensure that that is done correctly, okay. even if that person doesn't do the work. Often the person accountable may need to have some form of approvals or mm -hmm. sign off. And it's the point of escalation for the person responsible if that person comes across any problems during the yeah. war. So it gives clear lines of, of escalation. Escalation. I always think of the person that's accountable has got a sign on their desk saying the bus yes. stops here. Exactly. Um, the person accountable will be the one who gets in trouble. If something goes wrong with that task, it's the person accountable, the one who gets yeah. in trouble. I, I, I've got to admit, I love a racy chart. I think they're so useful. It's important to understand that the person accountable is the person accountable because there can be those confusions between responsibilities and accountabilities. This is something that you can use to tease those differences out and to get to the true person that's got the approval or the decision-making accountability. Um, what about the uh, the C and the I? What's the difference between somebody who's consulted and someone who's informed? Consultation involves two ways, okay? So for that particular task or work package in your work breakdown structure, you may need to consult certain people in the team or mm -hmm. stakeholders, whereas informing is only one way. Informing yeah. just means keeping someone notified, keep them up to date. Yeah. So for example, yeah. if you're building your house, the person responsible to do the drawings may need to consult the structural engineer yeah. to just um, check the drawings. It's two ways. However, that person may only need to notify the builders yeah. on the progress or yeah. on uh, how things are happening. going, not expecting any feedback or, or input. It's just one way. I find that this is really important to split those people out. I, I, I would imagine that lots of our listeners have had the situation where they feel that they're having meetings with too many people coming to the meeting and needing to feel that they're being consulted <laughs> and, and involved in, in things. Using the RACI chart to tease out who actually really needs to be consulted, who needs to be in that meeting and who needs to just get the information out of it and update an email and copy of the minutes afterwards and just be informed about the meeting. That can strip down quite a bit of bureaucracy and time wasting in organisations. Yeah, it's one of my favourite tools because you could use that as a project manager to also get buy-in. You don't do that on your own. You don't just go to your desk and write a race chart. So usually... You will try to use a meeting or a workshop to discuss those assignments of responsibilities and that can help also to get agreement, to get yeah. people to abide by that racy chart and avoid things like sloppy shoulders and people not knowing what they're doing. It really helps yeah. shedding some clarity. Particularly if you're working cross-functionally with people from different organisations who might have different assumptions about escalation routes, it can get you that agreement on who's doing what, who's responsible for signing things off and who needs to be consulted. Yeah, I'm a big fan of yeah, the racy chart. <laughs> Me too. So you talked about resource management as being these three different activities. We've talked about identifying different resources is categorizing them, uh, allocating them, and how we do that differently in linear and iterative like cycles. And we've talked about the the OBS, the organizational breakdown structure, and the RACI chart. When we're then allocating our, our resources and managing our resources as we're going along, we might need to do two things, which is the final learning outcome. And that's knowing the difference between resource smoothing and resource leveling. So, Carmen, two terms here that sound almost similar, but they are quite different, aren't they? First of all, tell me what resource smoothing is and when would that be needed or used? So, both of them are two techniques that can help you try to fit the scope within the time and your resources. If we start with the smoothing, the, the idea is to try to maintain a stable resource profile. So smoothing is looking at trying to keep a 
deadline, a defined end date, and if you have any float available mm -hmm. in your activities, to try to avoid any picks and throws. What yeah. you're trying to do is to improve the productivity of your resources while maintaining that key end date. Your limitation when you do smoothing is your end date. There's another podcast on team management and leadership. Resource smoothing, although it is very much about protecting that end date and, and, and thinking about your productivity of your project, actually it makes for a more motivated, easier to manage team because you, you're keeping those resources as stable as possible. So you're not having peaks of, of demand of resources being involved and then stepping off the project and coming back onto the project. It's, it's far less disruptive. What about resource leveling? What's that? How's that different? So you may start trying to protect your end date and try to get a constant demand. The resources are limited. You may come across with a scenario that you need to work with the people or the equipment that you have. So what you have to do when you level the, the resource profile is to work with those resources available to you and then look at when then you could get the work finished with those resources. So it's almost the opposite. Now we have the resources we have. When can we finish with those resources? And practically speaking, what that means is that the project manager may have to extend the durations of the yep. task or maybe move in any non-critical activities. But often this results in a delay of the end date because your limitation here is is the resource. Resource levelling is a pragmatic solution. I, I've only got the resources that are available to me. Okay, what's the best use I can make of them so that we can get this project done? And as you said, it might mean that the, the end date gets pushed out slightly. That's right. It's more reactive. Yeah. Sometimes it's the last resort, but both of them smoothing and leveling. The aim is really to use the resources as efficiently as possible. Yeah. So therefore, the project manager needs to be proactive when scheduling and allocating resources to try to anticipate whether they're going to have to smooth or, or level their resource plan. Those optimization techniques for managing your resources. That's right. We've done a good review of resource management. We've looked at what resources are in the, the first place and then looked at how you identify them, categorize and allocate them, and then how you manage them over the life cycle of the project. We looked at a few different tools and techniques you can use and also how things might differ on linear and iterative life cycles. To come, Thank you. Quite a lot then. Yeah, that was good. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.